As I look back on my education, I am baffled at how poorly educated I was. Portland has a, a history, a racial history, uh, and it's not been good to minorities. Oregon in 1844 said any black person living here was subject to public whipping every six months until they left. I've been bitter. I hated white people. I absolutely hated them because of the crap. Like when my mom gets discriminated, like that's like, you are trying to incite me for a fight. I was never truly taught to think critically. I was never pushed to ask questions. When you got in trouble at school, it pretty much stayed in school. Nowadays, um, you, you do something in school, you could easily end up in juvie. So why is it that we have criminalized regular acts of mm -hmm. adolescence? I never understood why gangs existed in my neighborhood or why dad sold drugs and later became addicted to them. I used to remember bumping into my dad and be so emba embarrassed by him because he looked so doped out and haggard. I was not once taught to question these conditions. That there is no person of African-American descent in this entire building. You know, at least in LA, I had Latina, Chicana teachers, Chicanos, Black, Asian. I saw all kinds of teachers. That made a huge difference. It wasn't yeah. until I got to Portland where I was like, holy shit, every teacher is like white. <laughs> to think through the structural and physical violence that was designed to keep the inner cities of America poor and disadvantaged. This is my neighborhood. It used to be a traditionally African-American neighborhood, but um, years ago, everything started changing. Um, they started kind of moving the, uh, the black people out or the people of color out. The developers in the city are doing this on purpose, right? They're wanting to move people of color out they wanted to move people who are from lower classes out because they want to increase the value of those properties. If anything, I was taught that this was black America's fact of life. Because if I'm never allowed to own a nice house in a nice neighborhood, am I ever really going to be able to pull myself up? Yeah. If I'm always relegated to a certain area of the city, and if drugs are allowed to be in that same part of the city, and if I don't get to eat fresh fruit in that same part of the city, like what does that do to my opportunities, my life chances, and how is that different from folks who are able to escape that? Get your other teammates off. Don't worry. If you worry about your shooting, you're not going to shoot well. If you worry about getting other people involved, you're going to play well. Let's, let's share the ball. Holler. A one, two, three. Holler. Let's go. See, there's always a story to tell as we unveil through this evolution. The revolution. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Give it to me. Can't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Give it to me. Can't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Give it to me. Can't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Give it to me. Being able to step into someone else's culture and, and learning it yeah. and knowing how to navigate it is crucial. You know, crucial. It's crucial for white folks, it's crucial for minorities, and given the work that we do uh, at, at HAWA is going to be key. True. Because oh, sure. there's plenty of black folks that don't know how to talk to white folks. Yeah, so true. There's plenty of white folks that can't talk to black folks. All of us have had that experience being bridge builders and mm -hmm. connecting dots culturally for people. Yeah. Rob, what was your experience? Kind of took the route of like, you know, you are student athletes. So as much as we're going to emphasize on sports, I was like, this is what we're going to do at the beginning part of our class. Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically we got basketball practice second half of class. But if you cut up, it's going to cut into your basketball time. <laughs> Travel, travel, travel.
Bible, so listen, in basketball, look, if you're down on the ground with the ball, you can't get back up, okay? You know that. Ball going that way, let's go, right here. Yeah. Five, four, four, about 30 minutes. Pass it, who's open? There you go. Uh, hey, hey, hey. Have a seat, everybody have a seat. Today was definitely you guys' best day, okay? You guys think so? Yeah. yeah. You can tell the difference, right? What do you think the difference was? We got to play more basketball. Yeah. Huh? And we had way better behavior. Way better behavior. You guys got frustrated. I told you you got to keep it calm. Sometimes, I mean, in your overall day, you got to take a timeout. If you're not in basketball, if you get frustrated, if you get crazy, call a timeout, okay? If you need to take a deep breath before you do something silly, make sure you call a timeout. Good one. So, this is what I want to say. You start off the day, you did good. What do we need to do to make sure this happens every single week? Think if you're doing the right thing or not. Okay. Do you guys think you're doing the right thing this time? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? I want to know what do you think you've learned so far? If you don't, if nobody else gets to use the ball and you just keep it and then it's not really fair for the other people and then if you have sportsmanship then you could be like helping one another too. Good, good answer. We learn how to um, talk to each other and play together as a team. Yeah. Like so learning basketball. how to learn how to be a teammate. Yeah. Okay, cool. Who are you? If we, if we follow directions more often, we'll have more time to play and less time to like talk about other things. Dude, that's the best answer. And, um, good job. I wasn't trying to be mean those other weeks when I didn't let us play basketball. Remember that one day we didn't touch the ball? Yeah. I wasn't trying to be mean. What point was I trying to make? But. You were trying to teach us a lesson. Stu, we talked about this. Student athlete, okay? Student comes before athlete, okay? If you cut it up, you can't be an athlete. Your grades are bad. Trust me, no high school team, they're not going to take you, okay? So it's important you learn those skills. Mm -hmm. All right, come on, you guys. Bring it in. Bring it in. Waiting for you. One, two, three, five. I think us being like people that look like them, like that's almost half of it. People don't always acknowledge it, but it is. Like it's huge. How old are you, Isaac? Fourteen. Fourteen. Where are you in the family? Are you the oldest? Are you the youngest? I'm the middle child, I would say. I'm the second oldest. So what do you think of Hala? I really didn't want to go at first. Why didn't you want to go? I don't know, because I didn't know anyone. How about say how you feel? You got any love for you? feel good. feel good in the heart. Up, up. How, how do you find Eric? Coach Knox, I should say. I don't know. I like him. He's not like everyone else. Like, I feel like if I was on a different team, that coach wouldn't be like him. Like, he wouldn't push me to like do better. That's when you get better. You get better now. You get good. When you push, when you power through, when you're tired, you don't get good when, when you're not tired. Even when I'm mad, he still pushes me to like do it because he knows that I can. Have you? Well, have your other basketball coaches done when when you get mad? They don't do anything. They just ignore you. Yeah. What makes you? What do you think makes you so mad when you play? Um, when I'm not doing things right, it's frustrating. So you're mad at yourself. And what does Coach Knox talk to you about? He explains it better so that I can get it. And he won't stop like teaching me until I get it right. Mm -hmm. With Alizé, when she trains, she like she does it over and over and over and over until she gets it right to yeah. You know, she can't just do it and be like okay I got it but not really know like she gets when she does practice she she goes out there and she she learns her you know her play so if she doesn't make the baskets or if she misses a, the ball or you know she gets very emotional but that's just how she is that's her nature yeah that's her and I always tell Coach Knox, you know my baby's emotional. <laughs> <laughs> he just lets her know. He, he sits her down and talks to her and just lets her know. Like, say, for instance, she'll be upset because she didn't get the ball enough that game. And he'll say, hey, it doesn't matter how many times you get the ball. It matters how, how you did during the game. So, you know, you were out there. You got this many assists and you got this many, you know, um, rebounds. And so he just, he, and it, he, it makes her understand better. Yeah. Tell me more about why it's different working with Coach Knox to working with other coaches you've had. 
I don't know, he believes in me. I got involved with the I Have a Dream Foundation because I really believe that education is the way to help people. This is our second year collaborating with HALA because especially our African-American kids, there's nobody really like them mm -hmm. here. There are no staff of color except myself here at Alder, and so Hala came in and brought in a male mentor and a female mentor to really help support our kids of color who were struggling, letting our kids know that there was another an adult like them who may understand their experience that they yeah. can talk to. I see our kids get excited to see their hollow mentors and you know they reach out to them and they light up yeah. and it it's really neat to see that eric's got a very positive message so i think having somebody around who just takes that we can do it he, he kind of hypes you up and motivates yeah. you in a way the way he talks to you he talks like you could you feel like you could conquer the world after you talk to eric Whatever it is that you dream about, you're excited about, you're passionate about, you got to get to a place where nobody talks you off of that because you will have circumstances, I guarantee, in your life that will try and back you down from the very things you believe about who you are as a person and the talent that you've been given. And listen, it doesn't have to be sports. It can be writing. It can be rapping. It can be singing. It can be dancing. It can be doing hair. It could be going to college. You could be want to be an attorney. I don't know what it is that you want to be. I don't know what hill you're climbing. I don't know what castle you're pursuing. But for me, it was hoop. It was basketball. Wing, wing, double post, post. One, one, four. Go! Behind you, Rosie! Who's that ball? I just think in life, if you're going to be effective as a mentor, you got to be two things. You got to be tough, you got to be tender. Yeah. You got to be loving, and you got to be truth telling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's too many people out here that drink the Oprah Winfrey Kool Aid. Everybody yeah. gets a trophy, nobody's feelings get hurt. And let me tell you why I'm not happy. The second team attitude was not good. The way you talk to each other, your parents, the, the refusing of shaking the other girl's hands, that is not okay. Not here. You might you can do that somewhere else, but you are not gonna do that not at our not in our program. Okay, this is this is not some hood program where we just gonna let you act however you wanna act. When you start impacting your other teammates, you start talking smack to your parents, you don't shake the other team's hand, I got big issues because you're representing not just you, you're representing Howard. And that is not the message I'm trying to send to the teams we play. I don't care if you're tired, exhausted from the first game, how you play and conduct yourself is crucial. You guys got that? There's an expectation in Hala that you have to maintain a minimum of 2.5 uh, grade point average. And you, ha you can't dip below 90% in terms of attendance. You have to get at least a G in terms of behavior in class. And so, that, so our program, there's an incentive base to what we do. So kids that come through our program, the expectation is, is that those kids are fulfilling that while they play basketball. So by the time they get to their high school, they're, you know, they're they're not just athletes, they're student athletes. And that's that's crucial. I went to college, what not just because I was an athlete, there were lots of kids in my neighborhood that were better, more athletic, more talented than I was. But I went to class, handled my books, took care of what I needed to take care of academically. And so when the college came knocking on my door, I was eligible for college because I was a student athlete. And that's part of the environment we want to create at HALA. Yeah. So how old are you? I am 14. You're 14? Yes. I was a straight A student. Now I have a couple of Bs. <laughs> <laughs> but it's always been education and basketball for me. I would love to become 
a lawyer or a surgeon. Um, my family was not the best. I witnessed drug and alcohol use, you know, just a lot of violence. Never a stable home. Yeah. Both my parents have been in jail. My father was in jail for 11 years and my mom would have like the three months to six months. Mm -hmm. My mom was never really around when I was younger. So I would always have to babysit my sisters and I didn't have the activities that I normally would want, but basketball. So basketball was the only activity you still had? Yes, yeah. I did everything to get to basketball. Yeah. Um, there was a huge argument with my mother and me over basketball and that's kind of what separated us and I ended up moving in with my grandmother during the winter and then three days later my mom went to Florida. Wow. She thought that I should be doing other things. She didn't think that a girl should be playing basketball. Right. Rather cook and clean. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. And now my mom won't talk to me. She, when she moved to Florida, she didn't talk to me for months, and I was wondering why I missed her so much. Mm -hmm. My friends know that sometimes I just break down in the hallways at school and just cry because I wanted just to hear my mom's voice. And I see her on Facebook all the time, like I see all her posts, and she just won't respond to me. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why. You don't know why? And I feel like she doesn't understand that I don't care. I don't care if she's rich. I don't care if she lives in a shack. Yeah, yeah. I still love her and I just want to talk to her. Like, like two minutes on the phone would be awesome. Yeah. At 18 and a half, I committed armed robbery with a drug dealer for half a pound of marijuana at gunpoint. And uh, how old was Maya when you went down? She wasn't even born. Right. Her mother was six months pregnant and uh, she was born October 25th, 1999. So I was already in jail. Wow but I still can't fully imagine what it's like to grow up visiting your father in prison yeah. for 11 years, never yeah. having a memory. Her first memory of me being outside mm -hmm. was 10 and a half. I yeah. mean, when I came out the door, she didn't have, it wasn't like some people, some fathers might go to jail for two years, but their kids already ate. Yeah, so yeah, they've already yeah. taken them camping and they've already mm -hmm. tucked them into bed and they've already, you know, done other stuff. And so then they made a mistake and they went away for a couple years, but the kid has all these memories yeah. of dad yeah. shooting hoops or doing whatever. Mine didn't have any of that. And uh, that's been, a, that's been a, a difficult, difficult obstacle to overcome. Yeah. And what, is, what does Eric mean to you? Who? Coach Knox. Oh, my <laughs> bad. <laughs> so did you know, do you know he's a pastor? I did, and I thought it was pretty cool because during practice, he played Lecrae, and I love him. He's a Christian rapper. Yeah. So I just thought that was awesome. I'm learning this whole dad thing. If, you, if you're a mom that was never mothered or a dad that was never fathered, you have to navigate that stuff. And so I'm, I'm learning, especially as a Christian dad, how to, you know, pick my spots when I'm trying to share the gospel with my kids, my wife and I. That's always the struggle. Some of you parents know what I'm talking about. And so you try and weave Jesus into wherever you can weave him. My wife and I and our kids were having breakfast one morning and um, my daughter said something. And then I took it as an occasion to kind of weave Jesus into what we were talking about. And they all rolled their eyes. And my son, who's eating a bowl of cereal, says to me, he says, you see, I just finished this bowl of cereal. Go ahead. Tell me how this connects to Jesus. <laughs> Do you ever find sometimes that God will hook you up when you least deserve it? And when you think you deserve it, all hell breaks loose in your life? There's nothing you can do to get God to love you more, and there's nothing you can do to get God to love you less. This is my second stint in Portland. My first stint, I was, you know, I was in Portland. I was pastoring a church, doing youth work. And, and uh, I, I remember one morning I was working on a sermon. My oldest daughter, who was five, she's 14 now. Five years old, she comes into my office and I'm working on a sermon that I'm going to preach that Sunday. And she grabbed some typing paper and she took the typing paper and she did this, I'll never forget, she did this like this with the paper. And I was like, what in the world is she doing? And then she took a staple and she started stapling the paper like this. 
And I'm like, and I said, Michael, what are you doing? And she goes, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to look like my friends in my class. And uh, I was like, oh my word. And I just wanted to make sure that my black daughter Growing up in Portland, Oregon, mm -hmm. uh, it's been a tough experience. I had a lot of self-hatred, just not know, like there's no other people that look like you. And mm. when there's a deficit there, your self-esteem is messed up. I had to really grow over the years and of accepting my body type, accepting mm -hmm. my hair, accepting my skin, and really loving it seeing it as an asset not yeah, as yeah. a handicap yeah yeah because i think there's still something in me like i have to prove myself yeah yeah every day yeah and they have to prove themselves every day mm -hmm. and i feel that and but, i know and do that. you do you fight that because the fact is i walk in and i see these kids and i'm like these are the most adorable beautiful kids i think i've ever mm -hmm. seen and then you rush in and you're combing <laughs> their hair and you're, and you're teaching them aren't you that they need to look better be better in some yes. way i know and and i you know, I, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing sometimes yeah. because I wish I was more relaxed. Mm -hmm. But I feel like as a woman of color, I don't get that card. When a kid of color um, or a child is not groomed, yeah. they are classified right. as poor, mm -hmm. trashy, uneducated. Parents probably won't work with them at home. So right, right. why do we have to put extra work to them, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And so... I feel the responsibility and the burden for my children to mm -hmm. represent. So I am volunteering at their classrooms. Yeah, yeah. They know me at their school. I actually work at their school. Um, and we have to represent. When I heard Eric had a program um, that was mentoring uh, at Alder, I called him and I said, I will work for free. Look at this. appropriate time. <laughs> Here's the key, if you're not paying attention, in the group, you don't get a bag of chips. Thoughtful. That is a lot of good examples about being thoughtful. Holler girls are girls that are thoughtful, right? So now put your books away and we're gonna do a game. We're, and we're gonna work as a team. We're not gonna have attitudes. Because guess what? What's the word that we are? What are we? Sisters. Sisters. We are a community of sisters. And we don't whine. We just go with the flow. Oh, here. The girls at Alder that I've been working with, and even um, some of the middle schoolers, I see myself in them. I was vulnerable about how I grew up and how there was domestic violence in my home. And I was like, you know, who's had that? I mean, every hand was raised. All of them were first to fourth graders. Yeah. Everybody shared. Yeah. a story of domestic violence like it took me back to my childhood and the way I grew up and I didn't stop them from yeah. divulging who yeah. what's going on or what they've been exposed to because I could handle it yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I know and I could say I got through like hold on you know what I mean it's it's I, you're gonna make it Basketball, I think it defines me as a person. I'm really athletic and aggressive, and I just want nothing but the best, and I want my team to win. Like, if we, if something bad happens, like a turnover, I just lose, I don't lose hope, but I feel like we gotta do this. Like, we really gotta pull it together, and we gotta do it. It's just something I like to do, and I think it helped me mentally. So do you see yourself being a ball player when you, when you get older? The only thing I want to do. Yeah. <laughs> Travel. What? Travel.
Everything was perfect, but you had to, you took the ball and you ran over here. You got to dribble. So you say one. What? Then snap the ball. Come on, Jamila. Good. Wait, come on. Do it again. Come on, tight. Come on, Jamila. Catch it. Come on, Jamila. Now it's a harder pass because you created more distance between you and her. Don't come out, dribble out here, and then try and turn. Come off her tight. Everything's got to be tight. Ready. Coach Knox has really brought out the best and the worst of me and showed me that I can be a good player as long as I try as hard as I can. How old are you? 14. 14. I'm aware that your um, your mum, your dad, your um, Emil was just, your dad was just telling me that she um, has had a drug problem her, all her life too. Yeah. So how much do you know about that and how much do you see her? I don't really know much about my mom. I don't really like think about it too much. Cause I don't want to be that kid that's like depressed all the time. Me and Jamila, we together for three years. And we got divorced after Jamila, after Jamila born. I left Jamila mom in the house with Jamila, I go to work. And when I got home, Jamila home by herself. She little baby. Yeah. She left Jamila home by herself. Uh, the reason is uh, her mom, she got a drug problem. Yeah, she have a drug problem. When she left Jamila by herself in the house, I said, you know, I don't chase with my daughter anymore. No oh, nice. <laughs> oh, it's really beautiful, isn't it? I don't know why, but I like pictures. I just like, I don't like stuff to be plain. I like things to really pop out. So you, you're, a, a, if, if you don't mind me saying, an incredibly beautiful, uh, dark-skinned African-American girl. Right? Thank you. So, but I don't see any incredibly beautiful, dark-skinned African-American girls on your wall. I know, I really, I don't know. I just think every skin is beautiful, but I just can't find like one magazine that has dark skin girls in it. Does that have an effect on how you feel about yourself? No, I I used to be insecure about it, but I realized that it's not that serious and it doesn't really bother me anymore. As soon as you, as soon as you get in the middle of court, Maya, you grab the ball, you face the basket. Everybody else gets down the floor. When you guys have to move the ball, there's like many of times where Kai is standing there open and you guys are dribbling to the basket and you can kick the ball out. You gotta kick that ball. All right, let's go, let's go. Let's go. How long have you been coaching these girls? Uh, it's been about five or six months now. How did you get into coaching? Eric was my high school basketball coach. And how's the last five months been? Has there been a big improvement in the girls? Yes. Oh yeah, I mean, it. A, a vast improvement, yeah, but yeah. it's been challenging. <laughs> you know, you got to fight through the different, uh, you know, emotions, temperaments. But it's really been, it's really been awesome to see the girls gelling together and coming together. You know, so kind of like at the end, kind of like a family. You know. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I came from um, a pretty broken home. Um, there was domestic violence. There was. Um, drug abuse, there was um, a lot of drama. <laughs> yeah. And so Eric and the crew that was surrounding him, um, the mentors, um, all helped um, kids like me um, stabilize. It's just exactly what I needed and I was rough because of all the violence I had seen from uh, a civil war in my country, a civil war in my home with my mom and dad. I mean, I just was really angry, really confused about family, everything, you know? Just like, what? what is a mom and dad? I mean, and I love my parents, but I needed other people to kind of reinforce some stability, and that's what he provided. You know, and I could call him if my parents were having issues together and whatnot, I could just call and say, hey, can you come get me? Or, hey, you know, I need to get out yeah. <laughs> right now. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm going to ask you about your dad, if that's okay. Um, tell me what you, what you know about your father. Like, how well do you know him? If you don't want to talk about that, it's totally okay. I'm sorry, I've turned the camera off. 
Do you know why I would ask you? <laughs> because there's loads of kids out there who are in the same situation as you. And to have someone talk about what it's like makes them feel less alone and also makes them understand their own situation and your situation better. You know, because it's like part of the story of who you are. Mm-hmm. But if you don't want to talk about it, then it's totally, it's totally okay too. But I'd like to know a little bit about what it's like to grow up in the situation you've grown up in. What do you think? I can talk about it. Okay. Thank you. You're very brave. So tell me a little bit about your father. Um, when I was younger, I guess, I don't, I don't ever remember him being there. Because he was in and out of jail all the time. And I don't know, I don't remember him. Do you miss him? Does it help in some way that you've got someone like Eric to talk to? Do you know anything about Eric's family? Do you know that his dad went to jail? Did you have any idea about that? So I think he's someone who kind of understands. Anytime I get to talking about my home life, I, I always say I was a kid that was exposed to too much too soon. My earlier recollections was my dad beating the, the you know what out of my mom and the police coming and pots breaking and windows smashing and and I just remember that as a child sleeping in a bunk bed with my older brother Bill just scared and uncertain of what all this meant. I always felt like my mom never was properly mothered. Mm -hmm. She lost her mom when she was like eight or nine to cancer. She she had her own set of struggles growing up. Uh, I'm certain not having a mom present and uh, at least an emotionally, to me, an emotionally abusive dad. And she met my father of all people. Mm -hmm. I, I never questioned that my parents wanted to do their best, but they were broken. Mm -hmm. I remember my mom asking me uh, to buy um, drugs for her and going to Inglewood Avenue to buy drugs and then bringing that home to your mom you can only imagine what that does to a kid psyche you know having a dad that was on drugs or selling drugs or both mm -hmm. you know he had, he had been known in the city for throwing these drug parties and and he asked me at that age to start DJing him and I started DJing him and re I just remembered um, putting albums on on the turntable and then walking around the house to see what these parties was about and just going room to room seeing one room where people were doing or freebasing and in other room people just doing powder cocaine and other rooms people just literally having sex orgies you name it and that was just my that was my childhood when i when I get with these kids, I think the most important thing that resonates with me and them, and they don't know it because uh, they're too young to know it, is just the ability to resonate with that struggle, that pain. Being able to take that stuff and, um, and deal with it in my own life, I feel like when I work with these kids, it's healing for me. Yeah. Like, like, I don't know what they're getting in this, <laughs> but I know my, sto my, my soul is is being restored um there's so much unspoken in our relationship when i connect with these kids that they don't have to say but it says a ton mm -hmm. and uh it's out of that 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 um makes my work that much more beautiful mm -hmm. Come here. You got 
guys, we are not taking any pride defensively. Our defense right now is not good. We gotta take pride defensively. If they pass it, they're not gonna just stand. They pass and cut, and you guys watch them. They pass, you gotta put your elbow on them, not let them cut through. Don't trail them. Holler, one, two, three. Holler, let's go. Let's get some pride defensively. Let's go. Here we go. Logan, where's your man? Who's here? Middle away, trail. Good. Nice. There we go, Logan. Good job, Marin. Basketball has been a huge connection because I did grow up playing a lot of basketball. Yeah. All through, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, all the way up to ninth grade high school ball. And Maya's about to go into ninth grade. And she's been taking her hoops pretty serious. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hall has been a part of that. And so it started, hey, can I come to your games and support you? Yeah. And, you know, she's got a lot of games, both with the Jason Lee team and then with the Hall team. And it seems she appreciated that, man, maybe my dad knows a thing or two about this yeah, sport. Yeah. Um, and so that kind of became a glue. Yeah that allowed in the last three months mm -hmm. for us to connect. And so now, like, often I've taken her on Saturday to the church. We have a gym, and we've done basketball drills, and nice. like one-on-one, and, and uh, she's developed in her, her game, and, and all the games that Hall's allowed and, and so forth has been, been a great opportunity. She's, she's, she's had some camaraderie with the girls. Mm -hmm. That relationship has opened up, and we've had some time in the last few minutes to connect. Dear Caleb, for three years of my K-8 schooling, from 7.40 a.m. until 3.05 p.m., I was black and invisible. I was bused across town to integrate a white school in southeast Portland, Oregon. We arrived at school promptly at 7.30 and had 10 full minutes before the white children arrived. We spent that time roaming the halls, happy, free, normal. Once the white children arrived, we became black and invisible. We were separated so that no more than two of us were in a class at a time. I never saw black people in our textbook unless they were in shackles or standing with Martin Luther King Jr. I liked school and I loved learning, but I never quite felt right or good. I felt very black and obvious because I knew that my experience was different from that of my peers, but I also felt invisible because this was never acknowledged in any meaningful way. I became visible again at 3.05 when I got back on the bus with the other brown faces to make our journey home. I think, you know, one of the things about segregation, so generally, you know, segregation, obviously, very bad, evil, horrible, right? Um, but one thing that got lost in that when we started to forcefully integrate, and by integrate, of course, we, we took black kids out of their schools and bust them to white schools, and in fact, that's what happened to me. But one um, horrible, I guess, side effect of that was that we lost black teachers, teachers who are part of the community. They used to go to church with the kids. They were intimately involved in the children's lives. And I think that that made a huge difference, right? Because if you know that your mom might run into Mrs. Teacher this weekend or tonight at the store, <laughs> you're gonna act a little differently, yeah. <laughs> right? So I am a certified teacher. I was in the classroom for 20 years, all middle school. Now I go out into schools and work with teachers, um, work with principals, and I help provide resources and coaching for them to be more um, culturally responsive teachers. Glenn Singleton wrote a book called Courageous Conversations About Race, which is sort of what started our journey. You know, the reason the focus is on race is because of um, institutional racism. We believe that white teachers can do a great job of teaching students of color, but we really need to examine our practice and how we're showing up that may be creating barriers um, for our students of color. There are lots of opportunities in Portland to educate yourself. You know, there's, for example, there's an event once a month at Kennedy School called Race Talks. Sometimes I'll be talking to a white person and they'll say, well, we grew up, there was only white people, so we couldn't have racism. Which I always think that means that, you know, if there was somebody to be racist to, you would, but gosh darn it, you didn't have that chance. Um, uh, growing up in the South, you would hear things like, well, uh, hey, slavery ended in 1865. There's no more racism anymore. Uh, I had a student once in Atlanta tell me that racism ended in the 60s. Black people are just complaining now. We as black folk go where we have a sense of empowerment. 
In those days, the hub of, of all black outreach strategic design was, was in, it was centered in the church and went there outward. Now, I'm not trying to make a religious statement or anything, but that historically has been our point of, of, of galvanization and, and uh, organization and unity. And when we kind of went secular, you know, we lost our capacity, I think. You know, that's, and when I come to Oregon, that's basically what I see. I don't, I don't, you, you don't have that hub and spoke, and therefore there's not the opportunities for empowerment and organization, outreach, and none of that. We all carry these um, racial biases because of the, um, you know, because of the society we live in, um, and because of our history as a nation, what race has meant, rather than sort of running away from that, we need to examine it. You know, Oregon, before it became a state, had on the books the Lash Law. Oregon banned slavery, right, and in 1844 said anybody who had an enslaved black person had to free them within three years, but again, said that any black person living here was subject to public whipping every six months until they left. Black people specifically were not allowed to move here. We we're not allowed to own property. We we're not allowed to make contracts, right? I think this is incredibly important. This was not Oregon's um, choice to be just, right? This was about Oregon trying to avoid this, this conversation about race that was happening. It's easy to dismiss racism as a, something that happened a long time ago, and B, something that white people do in the South, yeah. but not here in Oregon. And so we were talking about covenants and um, agreements that folks who sold houses had with the people who bought the house. One of my students was able to produce his housing covenant. And it said there in black and white that no person of Negro lineage should live in that house. And that blew kids away. And I didn't have to say anything else, yeah. right? And so the document spoke for itself. And so all I had to do was facilitate, you know, okay, so what do we do with that? And what does that mean? And what does that mean about wealth and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps? Because if I'm never allowed to own a nice house in a nice neighborhood, am I ever really going to be able to pull myself up? Yeah. If I'm always relegated to a certain area of the city. And if drugs are allowed to be in that same part of the city, and if I don't get to eat fresh fruit in that same part of the city, like what does that do to my opportunities, my life chances, and how is that different from folks who are able to escape that? This is my neighborhood, definitely, this is my neighborhood. This is Farragut Park on Farragut and Commercial. Um, I grew up here. It used to be a traditionally African-American neighborhood, but um, years ago, everything started changing. Um, they started kind of moving the, uh, the black people out or the people of color out. Is this close to the neighborhoods that you mentor in? Um, no, not at all. The neighborhoods that I mentor in is Southeast Portland, and this is North Portland. That's where I was needed, was out there in Southeast. Out there, there were a lot of, uh, a lot of white female teachers trying to teach these black and Hispanic children. And I'm not saying that their methods were wrong, but it's different. Like, I can guarantee you that they're raised a different way yeah. than the teachers out there raise their children and talk to their children. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's different. I wasn't raised like that. You know, my parents didn't talk to me, asking me. Uh, they didn't make requests, they made demands. You yeah, know, yeah, like yeah. it was never, will you please go clean up the room? It was, go clean up the room or there will be consequences and repercussions. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and they, they kind of needed that. A lot of the kids out there were, were babied a lot. They talk back to the teachers when the teachers ask them to do something. Just coming from a different type of background, you know, you just understand certain things about, you know, certain ethnic groups. And I was able to identify with it and it, it worked.
do you get cynical sometimes? Do you feel hopeless sometimes? Do I get cynical sometimes? Yes. Do I feel hopeless at times? I haven't felt hopeless yet. You know, mm -hmm. who's, I don't know what the future holds, but um, I don't know. I feel like you can never abandon hope. Yeah. Just for the simple fact that that's all you got. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you, you would just hope for a better day and put some actions behind that hope. That's, that's all you can do. Hope and hard work. Well, one of the interesting things about the situations of, of kids of color is that very often their circumstances are blamed on the culture that they're a part of, right? Now, it's very interesting that they live in areas that have been, um, that are underfunded, uh, where there's no resources. Very often also the classroom sizes are large. So for example, my sister taught a classroom where the kids would have to sit on the windowsills and on the air condition. The infrastructure in the areas are underfunded, so they don't have access to all these resources, right? So this creates a lot of problems in terms of poverty, in terms of kids not having things to do after school. The problems that we associate with those neighborhoods are created as a result of the fact that we as a society don't want to invest resources in those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a much larger sort of historical problem that starts with when the law passes so that schools have to be integrated. So as these schools that are part of you know, the regular public schools throughout the city become integrated, you, there, there begins to be white flight. A lot of, of, of the white folks did not want to live close to the highway. They didn't want to live close to the industrial areas. Right? They wanted to live more far out in the scenic sort of suburb areas, more space, more grass, more yards. And now there's this, there's this move where people want to live closer to the center of the city so that they don't have to spend so much time commuting. Those areas are being gentrified. I was just one when we moved from Philadelphia to East Norton. Robberies at 16th Street had roots in mothers, dreams and feelings. White flag. One day I was playing the piano and um, just started thinking about my family and realized that we had moved out of an urban um, area in the late 70s and that we were part of this much broader like um, social, um, uh, what's it called, phenomena called white flight where you know white people were moving out of city centers because they felt unsafe or um, you know property values were going down. Unemployment Poverty, working class was on its knees in white fly, white fly, white fly, white fly. Oh, white fly. Oh, I, that was the f I, although I knew obviously my whole life that I'd moved from an urban center to the suburbs when I was one, I never put it in the larger context of like, oh, we were, we like participated in this major. Um, you know, social historical change in sort of like um, in in the urban centers of America, and then that made me reflect on current patterns, which are like, oh, all the white folks are moving back into urban centers, pushing minorities um, mm -hmm. to like outskirts where it's harder to you know get public transportation, and um, where sometimes the school districts aren't you know. Um, super well funded so it's just like this alternating like uh, push and pull when i got to college that book right there changed my life what does that say right here 12 years of slave that book changed my life i was in an african american studies class and i got caught cheating on a paper the teacher said this is what i want you to do eric I want you to write a 10 page paper, single space. That's like 20 pages when it's single space. And I want you to have this paper done in five days. And if you don't have this paper done in five days, we're kicking you out of Oregon State University. So how many of you know my dream was getting ready to come crashing down at my feet? She gave me this book. She said, I want you to read this book and I want you to write 10 pages on this book on how it impacts your life. 
Now, mind you, I was not a good student. I didn't like to read. I struggled with homework. I did just enough to get to college. I wasn't that motivated. And so she's asking me to now read this book and write a 10-page paper on it in five days. I'm terrified. I start reading this book, and I read and read and read, and I start writing and writing and writing, and I'm getting so excited about this book that I forget that this is a homework assignment. And by the time I get done after five days, the, the, the paper is no longer 10 pages, the paper is 17 pages. And I tell people it was at this point that Eric Knox, me, the student was birth. All of a sudden, I started seeing the value in education, how books had transformed my life, how handling my homework could create a whole nother world and reality for me. I think for me, having the mentors like mentors from Hollow who can actually relate to our kids and understand their journey and understand their struggle and understand the barriers that they face, the very subtle things that go on that nobody is going to understand but somebody who has walked a mile in your shoes. The thing about social justice is it's the idea that everyone has the opportunity to reach his or her full potential. And the bottom line is that's not happening in our schools today. So I think an organization like HALA um, steps in and says we're going to try to bridge that gap or we're going to try to stand up and stand in for kids of color. Having a mentor who has gone through the same experiences that you've gone through is really important, right? Because they're aware of the challenges that you're facing. They're aware of um, what's going on in your brain, sort of, as you're going through these things in life. So that they can provide uh, experiences, they can tell stories, um, they can very powerfully shape how it is that the kids are thinking about these challenges that are ahead of them. Uh, and, and most importantly, they can see, wow, if he made it, then I can make it. The most important piece for Holland that separates us is the, the way in which we try and educate. Teaching or education tends to go one way from teacher to student. And, and I think there's a confluent oscillation that happens between the teacher and the student where the teacher has to be the student and the student has to be the teacher. Because there's experiences and, and cultural pieces about who our kids are that, that are meaningful and powerful. It is these kids who live on the eastern edges of the city of Portland who may never know why they were pushed to these margins. It is these kids from whom Hala exists, not as an organization that comes to teach, though there will be teaching, but as one that comes to be educated, to stand in solidarity with them and exchange roles by valuing, experiencing, sharing, and reflecting on their conditions, knowing that their conditions are my conditions. That's how I see Hala, the mentor and mentee being transformed together as they engage in authentic praxis, which requires reflection, critical dialogue, and action. Do you know what gentrification is? No. <laughs> no. There isn't that many black people here, mm -hmm. so it takes a long time for me to go visit my friends. Kind of like, oh, I'm stuck on an island by myself. <laughs> yeah, you're a long way out here. Now. <laughs> yeah. This is a long way from where you, where you go to school. Yeah. Have you ever thought about why you live outside of Portland versus living in the middle of Portland? No. No. Let's get it in. Proud of you guys. Proud of you guys. Let's get holla. Come on, all them hands in. Hands all in. Holla on three. One, two, three. Oh.
contract to yourself The fact of the matter is crucial to your hearing now Everybody hears it loud Walls come crashing in, tumbling down Rumbling sound from the fumbling Fears that you're mumbling when You can just express yourself Roam free, be what you wanna be, undress yourself Be the best at pushing forward, go ahead, test yourself Be the center of your universe first and foremost Learn to adore those moments of silence Understand where the violence really came from We're all pilots from a starship non-divided But united, no matter how far you find it So we find this selector, I'm a 10 on the Richter scale I spread the truth that the world seems to rip it well See, there's always a story to tell As we unveil through this evolution The revolution